Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet. Please be seated. In the story we just read, Jesus is walking along the road to Jericho along with a crowd of followers when a blind man calls out to see what's happening. And when he hears that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, he calls out again, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And that's when he gets the rebuke from those who were in front. Presumably, those in front were among the closest followers of Jesus, or at least among the most zealous, because they had, in fact, worked their way into a prime position at the front of the crowd. And from this prime position, they take it upon themselves to become Jesus' bouncers, keeping the masses at arm's length, keeping at bay the less pleasant elements along the roadside. In the immediately preceding verses in Luke, we're told that Jesus took his disciples aside and said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked and insulted and spat upon. After they've flogged him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. But Luke tells us they understood nothing about these things. In fact, what he said was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. Notice how Luke reiterates their resistance in three ways. They understood nothing, it was hidden, they did not grasp. I wonder if there's a connection between this not grasping of Jesus' upcoming suffering and the harshness of their response to the blind man. Jesus' closest followers were not able or ready or willing to hear that he was going to suffer and they were going to lose him. And maybe that inability to enter into Jesus' sorrow and to confront their impending loss left them unable to show kindness to the blind man on the road. I want to read these passages from Luke in conversation with Naomi Shihab Nye's poem, Kindness, which she read for us as part of our Blandy lecture last week. Naomi said in that lecture that she wrote this poem after she and her husband had been robbed during the early days of their trip across South America, and they lost everything. The poem begins like this. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go, so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. To know kindness, Nye says, you must first know loss and dissolution. That is, to know and appreciate kindness, you have to become someone who needs it. Those who were following Jesus were unable or unwilling to feel that future dissolve in a moment unwilling to believe Jesus when he said that he himself was going to be lost to them. Before they knew what kindness was, they needed to feel the impending loss of the one thing they had set their heart on. But they didn't want to know how desolate that landscape can be. And because of that, when a moment came that called for kindness, they were ill-prepared to offer it. When the blind man called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, they sternly ordered him to be quiet. This man embodied the desolate landscape. He was blind and a beggar, in want, in need, vulnerable, dependent on the kindness of others, and this was a voice they didn't want to hear. Nye's poem continues this way. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Today is the Transgender Day of Remembrance. It's a day set aside to remember transgender people who have been victims of violence, harmed or killed because of hate and ignorance, and the worst human impulses to destroy what we don't understand. We need this day because if we are going to catch the thread of all sorrows and see the size of the cloth, 
this sorrow has to be among them. It's a sorrow that's too easily ignored or forgotten because in some people's minds, trans people are not supposed to exist. But trans people do exist. There are neighbors, our coworkers, our family members, our church members who simply ask to be seen, to be welcomed, to belong, to be allowed space to make their own way toward healing and flourishing. Yet too often, what trans people, when trans people speak out, they are sternly ordered to be quiet. If you are a transgender youth in Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, North Carolina, North Dakota, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, or West Virginia, and you ask to be allowed to have medical care that is widely considered best practice among physicians, you are sternly ordered to be quiet. This is a failure of justice and even more deeply, it's a failure of kindness. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. It's easier to turn your back on someone else's sorrow than to enter into it in a way that breaks you open. The disciples didn't want to hear that Jesus would be handed over to the Gentiles and mocked and insulted and spat upon and flogged and killed. It's as if they're saying, don't make me catch the thread of all sorrows and see the size of the cloth. Don't make me look upon or think about the suffering of others because it may break me open and what will become of me. And so when the blind man calls out for mercy, they sternly order him to be quiet. But Jesus, Jesus doesn't order anyone to be quiet. He gives a different order to bring the blind man to him. Notice that Jesus doesn't just go to the blind man and he doesn't just ask the blind man to come to him. He asks those who had just told the blind man to shut up to go get him, right? to become proximate to the man they wanted to ignore. And the man says, Lord, let me see again. And Jesus says, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. The story leaves us with a choice. To be like those at the front of the crowd who demand that others silence their sorrow. Or face sorrow so fully that kindness becomes the only thing that makes sense. But are we ready to speak till our voice catches the thread of all sorrows and we see the size of the cloth? Are we ready to see the blind man, the trans person, the invisible or the silenced and hear their story? Are we ready to walk with Jesus, the man of sorrows? as he is mocked, insulted, spat upon, flogged, and killed? If so, if we are ready to wake up with sorrow, then, as Nye puts it in the closing lines of her poem, then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore, only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread, only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. Kindness, like Jesus, raises its head from the crowd and said, it's you I've been looking for. You, the blind man, the trans person, the invisible, the persecuted, the sorrowful. As we open ourselves to the desolate landscape of sorrow, we also make ourselves able to be kind. Or rather, we discover alongside Jesus, that only kindness makes sense anymore. Thanks be to God.